Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this summer at Messiah, we're going through this series that we're calling Teach Us to Pray. And uh, as we've talked about the last couple of weeks, it comes from a request of one of the disciples to Jesus where he says, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gives them the... Lord's Prayer. Some of you are more awake this week than last week. That's good. So as uh, Abby just went through, we have our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Okay, we're going to stop there. We'll get to thy will be done and such next week. So this week we're talking about thy kingdom come. As we learn how to pray, Jesus instructs us to pray, thy kingdom come. We probably, you've probably said that one before. If you've been here to Messiah, you've said it every single week with us before. We, we say it, it's common to us, but what in the world are we praying for when we pray, thy kingdom come? Because, to be honest with you, I think this is kind of a foreign concept to us. In the world that we live in, we don't really deal with kingdoms much anymore. At least how, how it was used in Jesus' day. When you think of a kingdom, what do you think of? Maybe you, you, you think of a couple weeks ago, a, a royal wedding over in England, right? And there's a, a prince marrying a princess. You got all excited. You saw this kingdom coming, right? This pomp and circumstance of a, of a wonderful, wonderful royal wedding. And you say, well, that's what I think of when I think of a kingdom. Other than that, we don't really think of kingdoms, I think, much at all, right? Here, we don't have kings and queens, Right? We have congressional districts, we have Congress people, we have congressmen, congresswomen, we have senators, we have mayors, we have governors, we have presidents, we have vice presidents, and they're all elected. They're not really kings much anymore. And even the kings of the world that are out there, they're very, very different than the kings in Jesus' day. So to understand what Jesus is saying when he says, when you begin to pray, begin by saying, thy kingdom come, we have to understand what a kingdom meant for people in Jesus' day. And this is a little simplified, but I think you'll get it. If you were living under a rule of a king and say that your king was a very, very good king, and you had justice in your land, and you were taken care of in your land, and you were free to work in your land, you were free to own property in your land, and all of a sudden, a new kingdom came, meaning a new king came in and overthrew your current king. And let's say that that new king was a very, very oppressive, sort of tyrant-type king. All of a sudden, your life, everything about your life, went from being very, very good to being very, very bad. You were probably forced into slavery when this new king came, and it wasn't a very good thing. Everything in your life changed. Now, the flip of that was also true. If you were living in a land and all of a sudden, you, well, all, all your whole life you were oppressed by this evil king, and then all of a sudden a new king came, a new kingdom came in, and he overthrew this, this evil, wicked king, and you got a fair, just king in your land who wanted you to prosper as his people, all of a sudden your life went from very bad to very good. Your life completely changed when this new kingdom came in and overthrew the old kingdom. So when we pray, thy kingdom come, what we are praying for is that God's kingdom would come and completely overtake our life. And you might say, well, what, what in the world does God's kingdom look like? Well, God's kingdom looks like basically anything that, that our king brings in. And our king is Jesus. So anything that, that Jesus ushers in is the kingdom of God. And in fact, that's what he says right when he starts his ministry and he's calling his disciples. He says the kingdom of heaven, the, the kingdom of God is at hand. And what does that kingdom look like? It's pretty awesome. Right, John starts telling us off about the kingdom of God. He describes Jesus at a party. He's at a wedding, and they run out of wine. And what happens in the kingdom of God? Water is turned to wine. Pretty good, right? We see with Jesus, our King Jesus, he goes to those who are sick. We talked about the lepers last week. They experience the kingdom of God as they go from sickness to healing. We see in the kingdom of God that, that the dead are raised 
That the, the paralyzed people all of a sudden can walk. And, and most of all, we see in the kingdom of God that, that our sins are forgiven. Not on account of what we do, but on the account of what Christ has done. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, we, we pray sitting here in, in our own kingdom, that that kingdom of God's grace and mercy and love and hope would come overtake our life. And this is something that we desperately need. This is something we desperately need to pray for. But I, I think as Christians, if you've been around the church for a while, you, you pray this and you kind of get this. You get what Jesus does and that's good. He gives us hope. That was our opening song that we sang here and it's been stuck in my head all week from VBS. And, and it's wonderful to have that hope of Jesus. But we also hear things like we need to be the light of the world and we need to, to bring this hope to other people. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, when we put that into practice, though, I think we miss a couple words. We miss thy kingdom and we turn it into our kingdom. And what we end up doing is we put our pressure on ourselves that, yes, this kingdom of Jesus is good. I've experienced this forgiveness in my life. I, I need to make sure I bring it to other people. Right? And, and we put all this pressure on, myself, on ourselves. And while I'm not saying don't, don't be participants in the kingdom of God, I'm saying I think so many times we miss where the kingdom of God actually comes from. It's good to be sort of evangelized and such like that, but so many times we put that effort on ourselves. I realized this um, some time ago. I w it wasn't here in Tampa. I was visiting a friend who lived in another city of the country, and uh, he was a pastor friend of mine, and we decided to go to, to one of these sort of summer concerts. It wasn't a big deal, but like kind of bring your lawn chair concert type things. And we were waiting for the concert to start. And we were sitting there talking, and I think we were talking church stuff because we were both pastors. And, and the lady kind of sitting over next to us said, sorry, I don't mean to barge in on your conversation, but are you guys pastors? And we said, yeah, yeah, we're, we're pastors. And she goes, oh, yeah, uh, what do you think of this church? And I didn't know the city that I was in, so I asked, I, I didn't know the church, but my friend who was from there goes, oh yeah, that's the, the massive, huge church. And, and he goes, oh, I guess it's a good church. It's a really big church. And she goes, yeah, I used to work there. I used to be the director of children's ministries there. And we started talking more to her about what she did, and she goes, yeah, but I, I don't work there anymore. And we go, oh, well, do you still go there? What, what church do you go to? What do you do? And she goes, well, yeah, I kind of quit going to church a few years ago because I got so sick of every week having to come up with something new. I got so sick of every month having to get so excited to get more and more people to, to know about Jesus. And, I, and I, I just felt like I was failing through and through and through. And now I guess I still believe, but I really don't go to church. She was burned out by the pressure of trying to bring Jesus in, in her A game every single week. And I tell that story because that's not the only story I've, I've, I've heard of burned out people trying to bring the kingdom of God to other people. But I tell that if we look at what we're actually praying for, we pray, thy kingdom come. But, but my concern is so many times I think we try to say we need to bring God's kingdom. And we put that focus on ourselves and we end up burning ourselves out. You know, here at Messiah, it was an awesome week at VBS. And many of you were a part of things. And it was exciting, and it was, it was uh, you know, we were up at the crack of dawn every morning, and, and these couple, a uh, hundred and something kids were hearing about Jesus. But if you were volunteering at VBS, would you want to do that every week? Could you possibly keep that up every single week? Probably not, right? You'd, you'd get burned out pretty quick. I can tell you, uh, Abby and me would definitely get burned out really, really quick. Not that it's a bad thing to do, but if that's what we think we have to do every single week, we're going to burn out. And it's not just, not just with churchy things. Maybe for you, you you're, you're, you're dealing with some type of illness or sickness, or you know somebody that is. And you're saying, you know, they need God's kingdom in their life. I need God's kingdom in my life. I need that kingdom of healing in my life. You know what? I, I got to find this, this specialist. And if I can't get into this specialist program, then there's no hope for me. And we put all this pressure on ourselves to figure it out. You know, we got to get in that experimental trial or we got to travel a, across the country to go see this one specialist. And this one specialist is going to bring the power of the kingdom of God to us. And we put that pressure on ourselves. We do it in our families as well. 
We look at our kids and our grandkids who we, we love dearly and we want them to experience the kingdom of God in their life, the, the peace of Christ in their life. And we say, you know what, maybe they're having some trouble at school and we say, you know what, we got to get them in that specialty school. We got to send them to this private school. We got to get them in this charter school. We got to get them into this special program at school. And if we, if we can't do this, then, then they're not going to have that peace in their life. And we put all of this pressure on ourselves because we know the kingdom of God is amazing. We've experienced that, that grace in our lives that we say we need to bring that kingdom to other people. But as we pray, thy kingdom come, Jesus actually describes what that kingdom of God looks like. And as Jesus describes what his kingdom actually looks like, he doesn't say, you know, turn into BBC and watch the pomp and circumstance of the royal wedding and mimic that in your life. That's not what he says. Jesus describes his kingdom like this. And I just read it, but I'm going to read it again. He said he put another parable before them and said, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like a grain of a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. As Jesus describes his kingdom, what does he compare it to? When his kingdom comes, what does it look like? A mustard seed. If I was holding a mustard seed in my fingers, you wouldn't even be able to see it from where you were sitting, even if you're sitting in the front row. It's tiny, about the size of a pin mark from a ballpoint pen. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Jesus says when the kingdom of God breaks in, it breaks in in these small and insignificant ways. But then it grows and it becomes one of the largest plants in the garden, so large that even the, the birds can, can perch on it. And we see this with Jesus. As King Jesus brings in his kingdom, how does he bring his kingdom in? He brings it in like a mustard seed. He goes to a woman at a well who has been caught in adultery who nobody wants anything to do with, and he, he calls her out on her sin, calls her to repentance, and then sends her off forgiven and encourages her to go sin no more. It's a small, insignificant moment. But for that woman, it becomes this tree that the birds can perch on. It's a mustard seed moment. God's kingdom is coming to her. He goes to, to, to paralyze people that, that aren't even strong enough to get near him when he's teaching, that they have to be lowered through a roof. And he tells them to take their mat and walk and that their sins are forgiven. It's a mustard seed moment. But it's a moment where the kingdom of God breaks into their life. We see this time and time again. Everything that Jesus does isn't generally this big spectacle, but he goes to, to people who need his kingdom. One-on-one, -on -one. he forgives them, he heals them. But I think the ultimate mustard seed moment for the kingdom of God is when our king himself goes before the kings of the world and they sentence him to the death of a criminal on a cross. He's treated just like a small, insignificant criminal where he hangs and he dies and it looks like he has no power. But then three days later, we see that he becomes the largest tree in the garden. His kingdom becomes the largest tree in the garden as sin itself is defeated and Jesus is alive for you and me. So we pray from a place where we need these mustard seed moments in our lives that God's kingdom comes to us. That kingdom of forgiveness, that kingdom of life, that kingdom of hope comes to us. <coughs> So where are those mustard seed moments in your life? Where, as we pray this prayer, is God's kingdom breaking into your life? Maybe for you it was this last week at BBS, right? And you were exhausted and you were tired and you were serving and it was great. But maybe you had those mustard seed moments. Maybe it was a conversation that you had with one of the kids and you looked at them and said, you know what, Jesus really loves you. Jesus really cares about you. And their face just lit up. 
as they saw that and they believed that. That's a true story from one of our volunteers this week. That's a mustard seed moment. That's the kingdom of God breaking in. Maybe for you, it's that you, you're, 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 you're sick or you're battling some type of disease or you know somebody that is, and it's not that you go find this super, super good specialist all the way across the country that you have to fly to, but, but maybe the kingdom of God is breaking in like a mustard seed for you by that friend that takes you and drops you off just down the street at the local doctor and then picks you up, and before they drop you off and leave you back in your house, they look at you and say, hey, man, can, can I just say a little prayer with you? And that prayer that they prayed for is exactly what you need to get you through. That's a mustard seed moment. That's the kingdom of God breaking in. Maybe it's not that you get your kids or your grandkids in some specialty program at school or some honors program or something like that, but, but maybe the kingdom of God breaks into their life when an unexpected teacher gets placed in their life and they just love and care for your son or your daughter or your grandson or your granddaughter, and it makes all the difference in their world, and it's just in the, in, in the school that's down the street that they've always gone to. That's a mustard seed moment when the kingdom of God is breaking in. And we see that in these mustard seed moments of the death and resurrection of Jesus, that sometimes these will become huge things. Sometimes they'll become huge, huge trees, but, but in everything, with what Jesus has done, our King, we have hope. We have the hope of His kingdom that, that comes in and conquers that death. So as you live your life in, in the kingdom that we're in now, a kingdom that's full of death and suffering and sickness and sin, go to God in prayer. And when you pray, we pray, hey, King Jesus, thy kingdom come. God, send your kingdom to me, even if it's like a mustard seed. Because in those little glimpses of forgiveness and grace and healing, he is ushering us into something that's the largest tree in the garden. He's ushering us into a kingdom that conquers death itself, and in that we have hope. So we pray, God, thy kingdom come. Bring us into that kingdom. Bring us into your hope. Bring us into your life. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.